Chapter Ten of the Convict by G. P. R. James. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Ten. The town of Barhampton, or rather that town which it suits me so to denominate, is one of no great importance in point of size and of no great commerce, for railroads have not yet reached it, and the nearest point which had been attained by any of those strange contrivances for hurrying man through life and through a country lay at the distance of nearly fifty miles at the time of which i speak nevertheless it was a seaport and had it been near the capital near any important town or situated in a thickly populated district it possessed several considerable advantages which would have secured to it in all probability an extensive and lucrative trade it had a very nice small harbour for which man had done something and nature much the water was deep therein and had there been room for one of the unwieldy monsters of the deep a three-decker might have lain at anchor there with six fathom under her keel but the harbour was very small and had a line of battleship attempted it her boom would probably have knocked down the harbour-master's office at the end of the little jetty while her bowsprit entered the lord nelson public-house by the windows of the first floor boats and coasters of from thirty to ninety tons could come in at all times of tide but nothing larger was seen in the harbour of barhampton outside the harbour however in what was called the bay especially when the wind set strong from the southwest, a very different scene was displayed for there nature seemed to have laboured alone on a far grander scale two high and rocky promontories at some points about a mile and a half apart stretched forth from the general line of the coast into the sea like two gigantic piers one following the line of the high ridge which crowned it was nearly straight the other swept round in the arc of a large circle projecting considerably farther into the ocean than the other but gradually approaching in its sweep the opposite promontory so that at the entrance of this magnificent bay the passage was not more than half a mile in width few winds of all those to which mariners have given name affected in any great degree the deep still waters within that high and mountainous circle and there when tempests were raging without might be seen riding in calm security the rich argosy and the stately ship of war no cargoes however were now disembarked at barhampton except those of the small vessels which entered the harbour and which supplied the town and the neighbouring country with a variety of miscellaneous articles of ordinary use nevertheless in former times the town it would appear must have been a place of some importance rising up the slopes of the hills from the brink of the harbour its narrow tortuous ill-lighted unswept and dilapidated-looking streets reached the summit of the high ground where a number of superior houses were to be found somewhat stately in appearance antique in form and cold and formal in aspect except indeed where a cheerful little garden interposed blushing with china asters dahlias and other autumnal flowers yet even these could not give it an air of life or if they did at all it was the air of vegetable life there was no movement there was no activity in it it seemed as if everybody in the place was dead except a few men who had come in to bury the rest beyond these houses of the better classes as rich people are called were some poorer dwellings descending the slope on the opposite side of the ridge and beyond these again came the ancient walls of the town built and perfected when barhampton was a place of strength the town had not indeed been dismantled even yet but it had been disarmed and now instead of a large cannon the soldiers bearded like pard the broad ramparts displayed the nursery maids and the little children of the citizens flirting with apprentices or peeping out of empty embrasures or on the sunday the great mass of the inhabitants of the town walking in gay attire enjoying the fine air and gazing over the wide prospect 
round about nearly in the shape of a horseshoe from one point of the harbour to the other enclosing the whole city if it could be so called within their area swept those old walls time-worn and lichen covered and loaded with snapdragon no mason's trowel no busy chisel had been employed upon them for more than two centuries and the hard knocks of, of oliver cromwell's cannon had left traces still unobliterated even by the equalizing hand of time the external appearance of the place was not at all deceptive the march of improvement was not a quick march in barhampton in fact in the space of fifty years but one improvement had been made in the town and the audacious and reforming mayor who had sanctioned recommended and successfully carried out this act of innovation had been held in execration ever since by a considerable portion of his fellow townsmen the deed i speak of was the enlargement of the high street and the giving it as near as possible a straightforward direction it would now admit two carriages or even wagons abreast in every part formerly only one could pass except at particular places where a greater expansion had been purposely given to the road in order to prevent the comers up and goers down from jamming each other together immovably in previous times also this street had pursued a sort of zigzag direction which nearly doubled its length and this had evidently been done not for the purpose of avoiding the acclivities but rather for that of finding them out for even in going down the hill carriages had to mount as often though not so far at any one time as they had to descend and in coming up the rise seemed only to be overcome in order to go down and seek for another the same innovating magistrate who had committed this heinous act of straightening and widening the street had expressed an antipathy to the old town gates and their heavy oaken doors with portcullis and drawbridge but the whole town rose as one man to resist his rash and horrible proceedings in vain he showed that more than one horse had taken fright in going over the clattering rickety old bridge in vain he pointed out that a very respectable old lady had broken her neck at the same spot by a fall into the ditch the people said that the horses were mad and the lady drunk to do such things and the mayor died like all great patriots before he saw his schemes for the improvement of his native place carried into full accomplishment thirty years had passed since the reign of this potentate and a change had come over the spirit of the people of barhampton there were many great reformers in the place men who sighed for a complete change in all things who stood up for the rights and liberties of the people who would have all men permitted to sell gin and cordial compounds from any hour at which they chose to begin to any hour at which they chose to end who corrected municipal abuses and castigated corrupt parish officers who worried the mayor tormented the aldermen bored the county magistrates and members of parliament abused the overseers and set even the beadle at naught but in the mending of their ways they still forgot to mend the ways of the city that did not come under the notions of reform they refused a church rate and therefore could not be expected to vote a paving and lighting rate they objected to all taxes of all kinds and most of all they objected to tax themselves they evaded imposts wherever they could paid grumblingly those they were compelled to pay cheated the customs by prescription and the excise by cunning and thought themselves pure and immaculate if they only defrauded the state and escaped the law how often it is with men that punishment rather than crime is considered disgraceful but i must not moralize upon the little community of barhampton things went on increasing and prospering with the reformers at first they were moved apparently by nothing but the pure spirit of innovation but there were some men of more mind amongst them than the rest and having all agreed upon the necessity of great and sweeping changes in church state and municipality they proceeded to inquire what sort of changes were desirable 
they instructed themselves in what other people demanded and thus the reforming part of the population divided itself into three distinct portions consisting of whigs radicals and chartists among the former were some of the most respectable and dullest men of the town the radicals comprised the great body of the mobocracy the chartists were men of enthusiastic temperaments sincere and eager characters and in many instances of considerable powers of mind they saw great social evils magnified their extent by the force of imagination and unaccustomed to any of the details of public business perceived but one remedy for the sickness of the state and imagined that remedy to be a panacea for all ills moral force was a good thing in their eyes but physical force they thought a better they believed themselves prepared for all contingencies they imagined themselves ready to shed their blood in support of that which they never doubted to be good they dreamed for the crown of martyrdom in their country's service and in short they were political fanatics though not a small portion of true patriotism lay in the bottom of their yearnings for revolution on most occasions the radicals would join with them and therefore the chartists looked upon them for the time as brothers but the union was not solid and in more important matters still the radicals were disposed to support the whigs this fact began to be felt a little before the period at which my tale opens the chartists imagined that they perceived a greater sympathy in many points between themselves and the tories than between themselves and the whigs that there was more real philanthropy a greater wish to see the condition of the lower classes materially improved amongst persons of tory principle than in any other class but there were also fundamental differences which rendered perfect assimilation with them impossible and though they regarded the tories with a kindly feeling they could not unite with them for any great object such was briefly the state of the town physical and moral when the carriage of sir arthur adelon rolled through the gates which had not been closed for half a century and a drag having been put on it began to descend slowly the principal street of the place in that principal street was situated the small inn called the rose which though there were numerous public houses was the only place which kept post horses and honoured itself by the name of hotel the streets were miserably dark and nearly deserted and sir arthur adelon felt a little nervous and uneasy at the thought of what was before him in the heat of blood and party strife men will go boldly and straightforwardly towards objects pointed out by principles in their own mind and will seek those objects and assert those principles at the risk of life and fortune and all that makes life and fortune desirable but they proceed upon the same course with very different feelings when in calmness and tranquillity after a long cessation of turmoil and contest they return to the same paths even though their general views may remain unchanged and they may think their purposes as laudable as ever such was the case with sir arthur adelon perhaps if one looked closely into his heart and could see not only what was in it at the present moment but what i may call the history of his sensations we should find that his having embraced the extreme views which he entertained had originated in mortified vanity and an embittered spirit an early disappointment acting upon a haughty and somewhat vindictive temper had soured his feelings towards society in general and when shortly afterwards he had met a check by the refusal of a peerage which he thought he had well merited a bitter disgust succeeded towards institutions in which he was excluded from the high position he had coveted and he became anxious to throw down other men from a position which he could not attain it was by no regular process of reasoning from these premises that he arrived at the extremely democratical opinions which he often loudly proclaimed but the events of his early life gave a general bias to his thoughts which led him step by step to the violent views which he announced in two contested elections in yorkshire and at the present time though he had sunk into temporary apathy 
his notions were not at all moderated even by years and experience he was not inclined indeed to risk so much or to engage in such rash enterprises as he might have done in the hasty days of youth but the long buried seeds were still in his mind and it only required warmth and cultivation to make them spring up as green and fresh as ever nevertheless he approached discussions in which he felt he might be carried beyond the point where prudence counselled him to stop with a great degree of nervous anxiety and he almost hoped as his carriage stopped at the inn door and no signs of waking life appeared but the solitary lamp over the little portico that some accident might have prevented the meeting the next instant however a light shone through the glass door and a waiter appearing approached the step of the carriage saying the gentleman told me to tell you sir arthur that he would be back in a few minutes the baronet bit his lip there was now no escaping and following the waiter into a sitting-room he ordered some sherry and took two or three glasses but they did not raise his spirits all was silent in the town not a sound was heard but the sighing of the breeze from the bay and a faint sort of roar which might be the wind in the chimney or the breaking of the sea upon the shore solemn and slow vibrating in the air long after each stroke the great clock of the old church struck twelve and sir arthur adelon muttered to himself i will not wait at all events they cannot expect me to wait one two three minutes passed by and the baronet rose and was approaching the bell when the foot of the waiter was heard running up the stairs and the door was opened the gentleman sir said the waiter and entering more slowly a stout hard-featured red-haired man appeared well dressed and though clumsily made not of an ungentlemanly appearance sir arthur had never seen his face before and gazed on him with some surprise but the stranger waited till the door was closed again and then advancing with a slight bow he said sir arthur adelon i believe the same sir replied the baronet i expected to find another gentleman here may i ask whom i have the honour of addressing my name sir is macdermot said the stranger and my friend mr norris who is probably the person you allude to would have been here to receive you but being detained with some preliminary business he requested me to come hither and be your guide a little farther in the town the name given was information sufficient to sir arthur adelon regarding the person before him he saw one of the chief leaders of the great though somewhat wild and ill-directed movement in which he himself had taken as yet a very inconsiderable part he felt that his very communication with such a man compromised him in a high degree and he was anxious to ascertain how much macdermot really knew of his affairs before he proceeded farther he therefore slowly drew on his gloves and took up his hat saying i am very happy to see you mr macdermot i suppose my old acquaintance mr norris has made you acquainted with the various circumstances in which he has been connected with me not particularly replied his companion he has informed us that he acted for some time as your solicitor when you were residing in yorkshire and he has laid before us the report of several speeches which you made at that time with which i may add i was myself well acquainted before but which has given great satisfaction to every one present from the prospect of seeing a gentleman of such rank and influence and one who can so eloquently express our own exact sentiments likely to be united with us once more in advocating the cause of the people against those who oppress them will you permit me to lead the way sir arthur adelon had marked every word that was spoken with peculiar attention and macdermot's reply was a great relief to him norris had not mentioned the power he had over him and moreover the words advocating the cause of the people seemed to him to imply that nothing of a violent or physical nature was intended and that all the leaders of the movement had in view was to endeavour to strengthen themselves in public opinion by argument and by moral force he therefore followed with a lighter step 
and was conducted through several narrow and tortuous streets and back lanes to a house which presented no very imposing appearance as far as it could be discovered in the darkness of the night the door was low and narrow and stood ajar and when macdermot pushed it open and sir arthur saw the passage by a light which was at the other end he said to himself there can be no very formidable meeting here for there does not seem to be room for a dozen men in the whole house he was conducted through the passage to a staircase as narrow which led to a long sort of gallery running round what seemed a stable-yard at the end of which was a door which macdermot held open for his companion to pass when sir arthur had gone through his guide closed the door and locked it and then saying this way sir led him to another door at which a man was standing immovable with a lamp in his hand there macdermot knocked and the door was unlocked and opened from within the next moment sir arthur adelon found himself in a very large low-ceilinged ill-shaped room with a long table in the midst there were several tallow candles round about emitting a most disagreeable odour and casting a red glaring unsatisfactory light upon the faces of between thirty and forty men seated at the board in various attitudes at the head of the table in an armchair appeared norris such as i have described him before but any attempt to paint the other groups in the room would be vain for every sort of face form and dress which england can display was there assembled from the sharp shrewd face of long experienced age to the delicate features of the beardless lad from the stout and stalwart form of the hardy yeoman to the sickly and feeble frame of the overtasked artisan of the city here appeared one in the black coat and white neckcloth usually worn by the ministers of religion there a man in the garb of a mechanic in one place a very spruce blue satin handkerchiefed gentleman with yellow gloves and close by him another who was apparently a labouring blacksmith with his hands brown and sooty from the forge an elderly man in a well-worn flaxen wig with large eyes like black cherries might have passed by his dress for a very small country attorney and opposite to him sat a broad-shouldered man of six foot two in a blue coat leather breeches and top-boots probably some large farmer in the neighbourhood of the town two seats were reserved on each side of the chairman and while macdermot locked the door again and every person present rose sir arthur adelon with his stately step and aristocratic air but if the truth must be told with a good deal of disgust and some anxiety at heart walked up to the head of the table shook hands with norris and took one of the vacant chairs the other was immediately occupied by macdermot and then rising the chairman said gentlemen i have the honour of introducing to you sir arthur adelon whose station and fortune afford the lowest title to your esteem far higher in mind than in rank far richer in generous qualities and in mental endowments than in wealth he has ever shown himself the friend of that great and majestic body the people of this country he has always professed and undauntedly maintained the same opinions which we conscientiously entertain and he is ready i am sure to go heart and hand with us in all just and reasonable measures for the defence of our rights and liberties the whole party assembled gave the baronet a cheer and the sensations with which sir arthur had entered began already to wane even in the first excitement of the moment here however i must drop the curtain over a scene of which the reader has probably had enough and proceed to other events of no less importance in this tale End of chapter ten chapter eleven of the convict by g p r james this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter eleven it is the most difficult thing in the world to convey to the mind of a reader the idea of extended space by a rapid sketch you may say days passed and weeks but the reader does not believe a word of it 
he takes up the narrative where it left off an abstract proposition is put before him and he does not pursue it to any of its consequences he does not consider for a moment unless it be clearly explained to him how those days and those weeks with all the events which they brought to pass had wrought upon the characters the circumstances and the relative positions of the personages before him in a mere sketch with the pencil you can do better by lighter lines and finer touches you make distant objects recede by bolder strokes and stronger delineations you bring forward the near and the distinct nevertheless i must endeavour to pass over several days rapidly curtailing every unnecessary description rejecting every needless detail and yet dwelling so far upon the several events as to mark to the reader's mind that time was passing and bearing on its rapid and buoyant flood a multitude of small objects marking to each individual the progress of time towards eternity day after day was spent at brandon house in the usual occupations of a country mansion there were walks and rides and drives and shooting parties and the fact most important for charles dudley was that he was frequently alone for more than an hour together with eda brandon all was explained all was promised all was understood in less than two months she would be of age her hand and her property at her own disposal and dudley felt angry at himself from a sensation of regret which he experienced that he did not still possess the ancient estates of his house that he might unite himself to her for ever as pride termed it upon equal terms those were very very happy interviews sometimes over the green lawns or shady groves of the park sometimes alone in the library or the drawing-room sometimes sitting side by side near the river or in the deep wood and talking with a melancholy pleasure over the past or looking forward with a cheerful hope unto the future they wondered sometimes that these communications were so little interrupted and that nobody observed or attempted to interfere but sir arthur adelon was frequently absent on business as he said lord hadley was seized with a passion for roaming about the country which he had never displayed before and a sort of irritable gloom had fallen upon edgar adelon the cause of which he explained to no one but which was easily seen by the eyes of his cousin he often sought solitude shut himself up in his own room walked when he went forth in a different direction from the rest of the party and seemed involved in thought even when eda and himself and dudley were together without witnesses nevertheless he was the person who most frequently cut short the interviews of the two lovers or deprived them of opportunity when the golden fruit was at their lips he seemed to have conceived a peculiar and extraordinary affection for lord hadley's tutor and there was that confident reliance and unreserved frankness in the friendship he displayed with which dudley could not help feeling gratified and which he could not make up his mind to check even for the sake of a few more happy moments with eda brandon by fits and starts the young man would come and ask him to join him in his walks would seek his society and his conversation and would sometimes express his regard nay even his admiration with a warmth and a candour which seemed very interesting full of wild flights of fancy which seemed to dudley ignorant of all cause for such sensations in his heart as savouring too much of childish simplicity for one who was standing at the verge of manhood his conversation however was very interesting full of wild flights of fancy rich and imaginative in terms and overflowing with the deep stream of the heart he insisted upon it that his companion should call him edgar and said that he would always use the name of dudley and many a counsel would he ask of him and listen to his advice with that profound and deep attention which showed that for some cause or other reverence had been joined with affection this extraordinary interest sometimes puzzled dudley 
he would ask himself could edgar have perceived the mutual affection of eda and himself and could his regard for his fair cousin have taught him to love whomsoever she loved but there was no appearance of such perception when they were together not by a word not by a smile not by a quiet jest did he ever show a knowledge of their affection and dudley at length concluded that it was one of those boyish friendships which suddenly conceived and nourished by long after intercourse often form the basis of lasting regard which only terminates with life another person who seemed to have been much struck with dudley and who also occupied a good deal of his time was mr filmer but to say the truth dudley himself was less pleased with his society than with that of edgar adelon it was always smooth easy agreeable there was not the slightest appearance of effort in his conversation nothing strained nothing at all peculiar in his demeanour he was learned witty imaginative mingling quiet cheerfulness and unobtrusive gaiety with occasional strains of thought so deep and so intense yet so pellucid and bright that the hearer was carried away with wonder and delight he was fond of talking of religious subjects and with all the many associated with them by his church he had a love for and an intimate acquaintance with ancient architecture in all its branches and he combined therewith fancies hypotheses or theories as the reader may have it which gave a sort of mystical signification to every part and portion of an old building and spread as it were a religious feeling through the conception and the execution of the whole every church or abbey or cathedral which had been raised in pure catholic times was in his eyes but a symbol of the spiritual church a hierarchy as it were in stone he loved sacred music too there was not a chant a canon an anthem a mass or a dirge that he did not know and could descant upon eloquently or sit down and play it with exquisite taste if no great execution joining occasionally a powerful and melodious voice in snatches of rich song without the slightest appearance of vanity or display but merely as if to give the hearer an idea of the composition which he had mentioned all this was very charming but still there was something which made charles dudley prefer the frank free fearless conversation of edgar adelon he knew not well what that something was he could not term it a studiedness but it was all too definite too circumscribed by rules too much tied down to purposes and views which allowed no expansion but in peculiar directions although there was no affectation there seemed to be an object in everything he said there was in short a predominant idea to which everything was referable and which deprived his conversation of that wide and natural range that free and liberal course which is one of the greatest charms of friendly intercourse one felt that in a very different sense from that in which the beautiful words were originally used he was in the world but not of the world a time came rapidly when much was explained that was at first dark but we must turn to another of our characters whose fate was intimately interwoven with that of charles dudley lord hadley as i have said was frequently absent from brandon house and when he was present there was something in his manner which showed a change of thought or feeling he attempted to flirt with eda brandon a difficult matter at any time but more difficult still in the circumstances which existed and especially when it was done with an effort his manner towards dudley too was very different he sought his society but little was captious in his conversation with him and somewhat petulant in his replies he seemed not well pleased when that gentleman was with eda and marked his feelings so plainly that dudley was sometimes inclined to fear that his pupil had conceived an attachment to the object of his own affection but then again twice when they were sauntering in the park before the house lord hadley made an excuse to leave him and miss brandon together 
and walked away in the direction of the grange remaining absent for two or three hours in the meantime rumours spread and the newspapers announced that there were threatening signs in the manufacturing districts that great meetings of artisans were taking place in public and in private that the people determined to have what they called a holiday and that some great attempt at popular insurrection was contemplated by those immense masses which congregated within a very narrow space having the means of rapid communication ever open and whose amount of intelligence is sufficient to make them feel the ills they suffer and the wrongs they are subject to without showing them the best means of relieving the one or casting off the other the prompt and decided measures of government too were detailed in the public prints the march of different regiments was mentioned and some portions were displayed of the general plan for suppressing any outbreak which had been formed by the great master of strategy sufficient to prove to any person not infatuated by false hopes that the movements of the people would be effectually checked as soon as ever they transgressed the bounds of law to most of the little party assembled at brandon these reports came like the roar of the stormy ocean to persons calmly seated by the domestic hearth they were far removed from the scene of probable strife they had full confidence in the power and the wisdom of government there were no manufactories for many miles around and the nearest point at which there was any great congregation of artisans lay at some twenty or thirty miles distance where there were both mines and potteries nevertheless eda observed that her uncle read with the deepest attention everything that referred to the discontent of the manufacturing population she saw too that he was uneasy that there was a restlessness and an impatience about him which she could not account for and she pointed it out to dudley who remarked it also i have not seen him in this state for years she said and i cannot help thinking that something of great importance must be weighing on his mind i have heard replied dudley that at one time he took a very warm i might almost say vehement interest in political matters and went through a contested election in the north as the advocate of the most extreme pretensions of the people i have cause to remember that period dearest eda for with that election commenced the ruin of my poor father he had represented the town for many years in parliament when your uncle started against him upon principles almost republican as they had been friends from boyhood although the contest was carried on very fiercely by their several supporters it was conducted with courtesy and kindness by themselves as much courtesy and kindness indeed as could exist under such circumstances between men of the most opposite political principles my father was returned but some of the electors thought fit to petition against him accusing his agents of the most extensive bribery and corruption as the population was large and very equally divided in opinion the expenses of the election itself had been enormous innumerable witnesses were brought before the committee on both sides the investigation lasted for months the most eminent barristers were retained by enormous fees and though it ended in my father retaining his seat an outlay of nearly thirty thousand pounds was incurred by the contest and the petition to meet this expense he proposed to mortgage the estates when your worthy uncle feeling perhaps that his supporters had not treated my father very well offered to take the proposed mortgage at a low rate of interest it was necessary however that the title deeds should be closely examined and they were submitted to the inspection of his lawyer a scoundrel of the name of sherborne this man who was as keen and acute as he was unprincipled discovered a flaw in the title and instead of merely advising your uncle not to take the mortgage he communicated the fact to another party and a long lawsuit was the consequence which ended in our being stripped of the property which my grandfather had purchased and paid for my father was now loaded with a very large debt besides which he had no means of paying and his spirits and his health sunk and gave way at once in these circumstances sir arthur adelon acted with a degree of kindness which i can never forget he purchased a very small property which had descended to me from my mother 
at more than its real value and did not even wait till i was of age to make the transfer before he paid the money i had thus the means of comforting and soothing my father during an enforced absence from england and the long period of sickness which preceded his death at the moment i was of age i signed the property to your uncle though i had never seen him myself i wrote to thank him at my father's death but he did not answer my letter and what is somewhat strange he has never adverted to the subject since i have been here perhaps thinking rightly that it must be a very painful one to me i have been led into a long story he continued when i only wish to explain to you that sir arthur is known to feel very intensely upon the subject of the people's rights and claims that he sympathises deeply with these poor men in the manufacturing districts there can be no doubt and i rather think you will find that the anxiety and uneasiness he displays are to be attributed to the interest he feels in them eda mused but did not reply she was deeply attached to her uncle who for many years had acted as a father towards her but yet she might know his character better than dudley and might entertain reasonable doubts as to his being moved by the feelings which that gentleman ascribed to him she did not express those doubts however and the conversation took another turn the fifth day of dudley's stay at brandon was a sunday and it commenced with a tremendous storm of wind and rain the nearest village was as i have shown at some distance and sir arthur adelon though he courteously proposed to order the carriage to carry any of the party who might desire it to the morning service added some remarks upon the state of the weather and the likelihood of the servants getting very wet which prevented any one from accepting his offer a room had been fitted up at brandon and decorated as a chapel and at the usual hour mr filmer appeared to officiate in the celebration of mass eda brandon was not present for as she informed dudley she had promised her mother before her death never to be present at the services of the roman catholic church lord hadley and his tutor however with less rigid notions accompanied sir arthur and a number of his servants to the chapel and somewhat to dudley's surprise mr clive and his daughter also appeared soon after notwithstanding the tempest that was raging without dudley felt a reverence for religion in all its forms the worship of god was to him always the worship of god and though he did not affect to adore in a wafer the real presence of his saviour he behaved with gravity and decorum through the whole ceremony lord hadley on the contrary treated the whole matter somewhat lightly paid little attention to the offices of the church and kept his eyes fixed during a great part of the service upon helen clive with a look which was not altogether pleasing to his tutor nor did it seem so to edgar adelon either for when he glanced towards lord hadley for a moment his colour became suddenly heightened and his eyes flashed fire giving to dudley for the first time a key to what was passing in his bosom after mass was concluded sir arthur took clive familiarly by the arm and walked with him to the library begged him not to think of returning to the grange with helen till the storm had passed mr clive declined to stay however saying that he did not feel the weather himself and that as he had come up in his own little sociable helen would be under cover as she went back the day passed as other days had done but during the afternoon mr filmer paid particular attention to dudley and was altogether more cheerful and entertaining than he had been for some time as if the services of his religion formed a real pleasure to him the effect of which remained for several hours after they were over End of chapter 11chapter twelve of the convict by g p r james this librivox recordings in the public domain chapter twelve the morning of the second day of the week once more broke calm and clear and dudley was musing in his room on much that had lately passed from all that he had observed 
the day before he feared that the conduct of lord hadley towards helen clive was not that which he could approve and although he might have regretted much to leave the society of eda at that moment he would not have suffered any personal feeling to prevent him from urging an immediate removal from what he conceived a dangerous position if he had not recollected that the young nobleman was so nearly of age as to be very likely to resist any interference he was considering therefore how he should act when he was again visited in his room by mr filmer for the purpose of engaging him to take a stroll in the fresh morning air with many men the effect of intense thought and mental anxiety is very great upon the mere body and dudley felt heated and almost feverish he believed too that in the course of their ramble he might perhaps obtain some farther information regarding his pupil's conduct from the priest for he well knew that the clergy of the romish church look upon it almost as a matter of duty to ascertain the facts of every transaction in which any of their flock are concerned he therefore agreed to the proposal at once and after they had issued forth into the park pondered even while they were conversing upon the best means of introducing the topic of which he was desirous of speaking as they walked on detached masses of cloud left by the storm of the preceding day floated heavily overhead and the shadows and the gleams crossed the landscape rapidly bringing out many points of beauty which were not observable either under the broad sunshine of summer or the cold grey expanse of the wintry sky the scenery here is certainly very lovely said dudley and i think that of the park particularly so it is more varied as well as more extensive than any park that i have seen in england yes it is very beautiful replied the priest in a somewhat commonplace tone and indeed the whole property is a very fine one there are few heiresses in england who can boast of such an estate as miss brandon miss brandon said dudley in a tone of some surprise do you mean to say that she is the owner of this beautiful place i thought it was the property of her uncle the priest turned a short quick glance to his face and then replied in a very marked manner and yet with a well-satisfied smile i am glad to hear you thought so my young friend but in answer to your question this property is miss brandon's sir arthur is only here as her guardian it was much her mother's wish that she should live with him till her marriage but at the same time she expressed a strong desire that her principal residence should be at brandon sir arthur is a very conscientious man and he consequently having undertaken the task carries out his sister's views more fully than most men would be inclined to do the bulk of his own property is in yorkshire as i believe you know but he is not there any more than a month of the year the rest of the time is spent at brandon or in london may i ask said dudley what there could be pleasing to you in my believing this property to be sir arthur adelon's mr filmer smiled perhaps he said it might be more courteous to leave your question unanswered than to answer it but nevertheless i will not affect reserve i look upon it in ordinary cases to be rather a misfortune than otherwise for a young lady to inherit a large fortune there are three results each very common sometimes her relations and friends arrange and bring about a marriage for her with a man perhaps the least suited to her on the face of the earth some coarse and wealthy brute some dissolute peer at other times she becomes the prey of a designing sharper a man probably without honour honesty or principle low in birth and mind as in fortunes or if she escapes these perils and reaches the age of discretion unmarried from a knowledge of the risks she has escaped she is filled with suspicions of every gentleman who approaches her doubts the motives of all who profess to love her and fancies that her wealth and not her heart is the object sought i know not which of these results is most to be deprecated he made a pause and then continued with a smile that you did not know the property to belong to her 
shows that you can be influenced by no motives but such as must be gratifying to herself dudley cast down his eyes and mused for several moments he was not at all aware that his conduct towards eda had been such as to display the secret of their hearts to even the keenest eye and he was surprised and not well pleased to find that it had been penetrated at once by the shrewd priest as he did not answer mr filmer went on with a frank and even friendly tone i need not tell you mr dudley after what has fallen from me he said that i wish you success not with any of the rash enthusiasm of a young man in favour of a friend but upon calm and due deliberation you are a gentleman by birth and education a man of high honour and feeling i sincerely believe you to be and this lord hadley is in no degree fitted for her light and volatile as a withered leaf with no fixed principles and no strong religious feelings full of unbridled passions and appetites that have been pampered from his boyhood the effect of wealth and high station those two great touchstones of human character would be disastrous to him he is in the high road now to become a confirmed libertine and even at the present moment is labouring to destroy the peace of a happy family far more ancient and respectable than his own and to introduce discord into a peaceful neighbourhood where happily we have few such as himself to stir up the angry feelings of our nature you have touched upon a subject my dear sir replied dudley who could not help feeling gratified by many of the expressions he had used in regard to which i much wished to speak with you and i was meditating upon the very point when you came into my room i have remarked for some days past that lord hadley has been much absent from the house at which he is visiting so much so as almost to be discourteous and yesterday in the chapel i could not help observing indications of feelings which i regretted much to see and in regard to which you have confirmed my suspicions his conduct there was very reprehensible said mr filmer in a grave tone he spends the time during his long absences from brandon either in visiting at mr clive's house or in lying in wait for poor helen in her walks his object is not to be mistaken by any one of ordinary sagacity and knowledge of the world but yet clive though a very sensible man does not perceive it you must have remarked how blind parents usually are under such circumstances he looks upon lord hadley as a mere boy and a frank and agreeable one he thinks that his visits are to himself and the young gentleman with more art than one would have supposed him capable of takes care to go down to the grange when he knows that the master is out and has some excuse ready for waiting till he returns from what you tell me replied dudley it seems absolutely necessary that one of two courses should be pursued either i must immediately endeavour to induce lord hadley to remove from brandon in which case i am afraid he would resist as in a few weeks he will be of age or else mr clive must be warned and take some measures as may put a stop to this young man's visits i do not know that either is necessary answered mr filmer nor would either have the effect that you anticipate lord hadley would not go or would return to pursue the same course when he is his own master and in regard to warning clive i should have done it before had i not known and felt that it might be dangerous to do so he is a man of a very strong and hasty spirit resolute bold determined and easily moved by anything that looks like indignity to bursts of passion of which you can form no idea never having seen him roused neither have i any fear whatsoever for helen she is guarded not only by high principle and a pure and noble heart but by other feelings which are often a woman's greatest safeguard lord hadley will then find his designs in vain and i do not think he would venture to insult her in any way dudley mused for a moment having learned more of his pupil during their journey on the continent than he had known when he undertook the task of guiding him i do not know he said in a doubtful tone i do not know he had better not said mr filmer sternly 
but be sure my dear young friend that there shall be an eye not easily blinded on all his actions the interest you take in this matter raises you more highly in my esteem than ever and i will own that i could not help drawing a comparison very unfavourable to this young lord between your conduct and his in the chapel yesterday reverence to the ceremonies of religion is due even to decency if not to principle but there was something more in your demeanour which gave me good hope that if you would sometimes attend to the various services of our church receive even but slight instruction in its doctrines cast from your mind the prejudices of education and meditate unbiased over the principal differences between our church and yours of course not without full explanation of all our views upon those dogmas which are so erroneously stated by most protestant writers your conduct gave me good hope i say that under these circumstances you might be regained to that true faith of which many of your ancestors were the greatest ornaments dudley smiled the secret was now before him the priest had really conceived the design of converting him and his full and strong attachment to the protestant religion his unhesitating condemnation in his own heart of the errors of the romish church made the very idea ridiculous in his eyes i fear my dear sir he replied as the slight smile passed away that your expectation is altogether vain there is no chance whatever let me assure you of my ever abandoning the religion in which i have been brought up do not be too sure my friend replied mr filmer smiling also i have seen more obstinate heretics than yourself brought to a knowledge of the truth i do not despair of you at all you have a mind free from many prejudices which affect others of your religion you are not at all bigoted or intolerant and you view these matters so calmly and yet devoutly that with my firm convictions after much study and thought i cannot help thinking if you will but look into the matter fully you will arrive at a just conclusion i trust undoubtedly that such will be the case was dudley's answer but i believe my dear sir that i have arrived at a just conclusion already it has not been without study either nor from the showing of protestant divines but rather from the works of your own church many of which i have examined with great care and attention and which have only strengthened me in my convictions the more impartial a man is in forming his opinions and the less vehement and passionate he is in their assertion the more firm he is likely to be when they are formed and the more steady in their maintenance they had by this time reached the other side of the park and passing through a little wicket gate were entering the road beyond the walls mr filmer's lips were compressed as he listened and he seemed to struggle against some strong emotion but just at that moment the tramp of numerous feet was heard and looking up the road they saw a multitude of people in the dress of country labourers and workingmen advancing at a quick pace two and two in an orderly and decorous manner mr filmer and his companion paused to let them pass and as they went by talking together filmer could not help remarking that in the countenances of many there was a stern and thoughtful and in others an enthusiastic and excited expression which seemed to indicate that they were engaged in no ordinary occupation they passed on without taking any notice of the two gentlemen although two or three times dudley heard the name of sir arthur adelon mentioned amongst them and when the last had gone by he inquired not unwilling to change the matter of their conversation who can these men be and what can be their object in this curious sort of array i really do not know answered mr filmer but it would not surprise me if they were chartists have you many of them here asked dudley oh yes they are very numerous replied the priest but amongst the peasantry and the townspeople and these may very likely be going to some of their meetings on the downs both amongst the peasantry and the townspeople and these may very likely be going to some of their meetings on the downs they are all very orderly and quiet in our county however and indeed form the best behaved and most respectable part of our population 
a great enthusiasm is very often extremely useful the men who feel it are often restrained thereby from anything low or base or degrading to the great principle which moves them such my young friend ought to be the power of religion upon the heart and such it is as you must have yourself seen with a great many of the ecclesiastics of the church to which i belong base and bad men may be found in every country and will disgrace every creed but i cannot help thinking you will find if you will really read and study some works which i will lend you that the natural tendency of every doctrine of the catholic religion is to elevate and purify the hearts of men and to mortify and subdue every corrupt affection i know he continued that the exact reverse has been stated by protestant writers but they have been mistaken i will not use a harsher term and will only add study and you will see i will certainly read the books with great pleasure replied dudley but at the same time i must not lead you to expect for one moment that they will make any change in my opinions he spoke in the most decided tone and mr filmer replied with a slight contraction of the brows and a very grave and serious manner then i fear your dearest hopes will be disappointed dudley felt somewhat indignant at the implied threat but he was prevented from answering by the appearance of lord hadley who came towards them not from the side of brandon and who instantly joining them returned in their company towards the house affecting an exuberant degree of gaiety and laughing and jesting in a manner which harmonized ill with the more serious thoughts of his two companions the subject of the mass at which they had been present the day before was accidentally introduced in the course of their conversation which thence deviated to the ceremonies of the roman catholic religion in other countries and the young peer said laughing if it were not for its mummeries mr filmer i should think it a very good religion too a capital religion it is so pleasant to think that one can shuffle off all one's peccadilloes on the shoulders of another man that i wonder who would not be a roman catholic if he could a scowl momentary but fiend-like crossed the countenance of the priest and dudley who had observed it was surprised to hear him say the next moment with a bland smile you are a little mistaken in your views my lord and i think if you would examine the subject well under a competent instructor you would not find it so difficult a thing to be a roman catholic as you imagine i should prefer an instructress answered lord hadley with a laugh but mr filmer did not reply finding it perhaps somewhat difficult to guide his arguments between two men of such totally different characters and views as the young lord and his tutor the rest of their walk back through the park passed almost in silence but from various indications dudley judged that the previous gaiety of lord hadley had been more affected than real End of chapter twelve chapter thirteen of the convict by g p r james this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter thirteen to a person inexperienced in the ways of life and in human character it might seem strange that a man should pursue one woman with every appearance of passion and should yet at the same time not only seek the love of another but also entertain some feeling of jealousy at any sign of favour for a rival but yet this is the case every day and it was so with lord hadley had he been asked whether he admired helen clive or eda brandon most he would have replied if he answered sincerely helen clive but she was in his eyes merely a plaything to be possessed to sport with and to cast away while eda was looked upon in a very different light to add wealth to his wealth to flatter his vanity by the display of her beauty and her grace as his wife to gratify his pride by uniting the blood of the brandons one of the oldest families in the land to that of the hadleys who to say the truth required not a little to graft their young plant upon a more ancient stock whatever feelings he entertained for her certainly did not reach the height of passion but yet when he was beside her 
he evidently sought to win regard and it was plain that he by no means liked the preference she showed for dudley sir arthur adelon saw that something had gone amiss with his young and noble guest and while they were sitting at luncheon with not the most placable of feelings existing on the part of lord hadley towards his tutor sir arthur was considering what could be the cause of the coldness and haughtiness of tone which he remarked when a servant entering announced to mr dudley that a gentleman of the name of norris wished to speak with him for a few moments in the library sir arthur instantly turned deadly pale but recovering himself in a moment he started up before his guests could reply saying i beg you ten thousand pardons mr dudley but i have something of much importance to say to mr norris and if you will permit me i will take up his time for a moment or two while you finish your luncheon as i have got business which will call me out immediately and perhaps your conversation with him may be somewhat long dudley was replying that he really did not know what business mr norris could have with him as he knew no such person when with a familiar nod sir arthur said i will not detain him three minutes and hurried out of the room followed by the keen cold eyes of the priest who is mr norris father inquired eda brandon i have never heard of him before an old acquaintance of sir arthur's replied mr filmer in a commonplace tone he was once a lawyer i believe and too honest a man for a profession from which he retired some time ago not two minutes elapsed before sir arthur adelon was in the room again his conference with mr norris had been short indeed but it seemed to have been satisfactory for when he returned his lip wore a smile although his face was now a good deal flushed as if from some recent and great excitement you will find norris in the library mr dudley said the baronet as soon as he entered and while dudley rose and walked to the door sir arthur seated himself at the table and fell into deep thought in the meantime dudley proceeded to the room to which he had been directed and found there waiting his arrival the same powerful hard-featured man whom i have before described the keen grey eyes of norris were fixed upon the door and when dudley entered a slight flush passed over his cheek mr dudley he said there is no mistaking you you are very like your father i believe i am mr norris replied dudley pray be seated you are well acquainted with my poor father i presume no i had not that honour sir answered norris i have seen him more than once however as the partner of mr sherborne the yorkshire solicitor of sir arthur adelon dudley's face grew stern and he made a movement as if to rise but refrained merely saying mr sherborne's name sir is an unpleasant one to me i should not like to speak my opinion of him to his partner but were he still living i should undoubtedly let him hear it in person i was his partner sir in business but not in rascality replied norris the full extent of which i did not know till he was dead nature did not make me for a lawyer mr dudley and the result of my study of the profession has been to show me that either by errors in their original formation or by perversions which have crept in through the misinterpretation of judges the laws of this land do not afford security against injustice redress for wrongs committed protection to the innocent punishment to the guilty or equity in any of the relations between man and man with this view of the case i could not remain in a profession which aided to carry out in an iniquitous manner iniquitous laws and i therefore quitted it before i did so however it became my task to examine all the papers in the office of my deceased partner and myself many of which i had never seen or heard of before in so doing sir i found some which affected your father and amongst others several letters of his apparently of importance the latter you shall have the other papers relating to a contested election in which he took part are at present necessary to myself i feel much obliged to you mr norris replied dudley of course i shall feel glad to have my poor father's letters in regard to the other papers relative to the election as that has been a business long settled 
they can be of no service to me and i do by no means wish to recall old grievances i am now in the house of my father's opponent on that occasion and i am well aware that he then acted honourably and afterwards most liberally and kindly to my poor father norris knit his brows and shut his teeth tight but he suffered no observation to escape him and dudley continued saying i do not therefore wish for one moment to revive any unpleasant memories connected with that contest and think the papers referring to it just as well in your hands as in mine was this the only matter you wished to speak to me upon i have nothing further to say mr dudley replied norris rising but that i will in a few days send your father's letters to you at any place you please to mention and after having received mr dudley's address at st john's college cambridge he took his leave once he stopped for a moment as he was going out thought muttered something to himself but without adding anything more departed on quitting brandon house norris made his way straight to the avenue which i have mentioned once or twice before and walking hurriedly down under the shade of the trees he turned into a path which led through the copse on the right to a stile over the wall his direction was towards the grange but he did not follow exactly the same road which had been pursued by edgar adelon about a hundred yards up the lane there lay the entrance of another narrow footway which was sunk deep between two banks with a hedge at the top forming an exceedingly unpleasant and dangerous cut in the way of any horseman following the foxhounds and indeed there was a tradition of two gentlemen having broken their necks there some fifty years ago in consequence of having come suddenly upon this unseen hollow way in leaping the hedge above along it however mr norris now sped with a quick step till it opened out upon a little green where stood two cottages in a complete state of ruin to arrive at which more easily from the high road the path had probably been cut in former years on the other side of the green mounting over the bank and passing through the fields was a more open footway with a stile at the bottom of the descent upon which was sitting when norris came up a short slightly made man with a sharp face and keen eager black eyes well nichols said norris approaching i have not kept you long no no answered the other man quickly but what news what news mr norris what does he say why he will come nichols whenever we give the word answered norris without hesitation or delay indeed exclaimed the other better news than i thought i feared he was shirking from what he said last time or else that he would take so long to consider that we should lose our opportunity i took means to quicken his decision said norris but let us get on nichols for i expect conway and macdermot to join me at clive's for a consultation and we must then separate till to-morrow night is clive's a safe place asked nichols following as the other strode on rapidly he is dead against us you know norris but he would not betray any man replied the other and besides he is out at the town and will not be back for two or three hours nothing farther was said till they reached the grange where going in without ceremony norris put his head into helen's drawing-room saying i can go into the upstairs room which i had before helen dear i suppose oh certainly answered helen everything is there just as you left it but my father is not at home and will not return for some hours that does not matter answered norris and calling one of the maids he told her if any gentleman came to inquire for him to show them upstairs to him and mounting the steps he led the person called nichols into the room where his conference had been held with sir arthur adelon helen in the meantime remained below unoccupied apparently with anything but thought for though there was a book open before her she seldom looked at it she was seated with her face to the window which commanded a view of the garden and through the trees across the river to the opposite side of the little dell in which it flowed with one arm in a sling and the other resting across the book upon the table she gazed forth from the window watching that opposite bank with an anxious almost apprehensive expression of countenance 
and if she dropped her eyes to the page for a moment she raised them again instantly hardly three minutes had passed after norris's arrival when a figure was indistinctly seen coming over the slope and helen starting up exclaimed there he is again this is really too bad i am glad my uncle is here but before the words were well uttered the figure came more fully in sight and helen saw that it was that of a perfect stranger another equally unknown to her followed closely behind the first and she sat down again murmuring with a slight smile i frighten myself needlessly but it is really very hard to be so treated i do not know what to do if i were to tell my father what he had said and how he had treated me he would kill him on the spot and if i told edgar all they would fight i am sure poor dear generous edgar i can see he is very uneasy and yet i dare not speak it is very strange that father peter should treat the matter with such indifference i believe my best way would be to tell my uncle as she thus went on murmuring broken sentences the two men whom she had seen approached the house rang the bell and helen could hear their heavy footsteps mount the stairs she had turned her head towards the door when they came into the house but the moment that her eyes were directed towards the window again she saw the figure of lord hadley coming down the path with a proud light self-confident step and instantly starting up once more she closed the book and ran out of the room a maid was in the passage and in an eager and frightened tone the beautiful girl exclaimed tell him exactly what i said margaret if he asks for me say i will not see him make no excuses but tell him plainly and at once i will not that i will miss helen answered the woman heartily shall i ask ben the ploughman to thrash him if he won't go away if helen had uttered the reply that first rose in her mind her words would have been i wish to heaven you would but she refrained and saying no no violence margaret she ran upstairs to her own room and seated herself near a little table after locking the door what passed below she could not hear but between that chamber and the next was a partition of old dark oak not carved into panels as in the rooms below but running in long polished planks from the ceiling to the floor with the edges rounded into mouldings for the sake of some slight degree of ornament they were tightly joined together but still the words of any one speaking in a loud tone in the one room could be heard in the other and it seemed to helen from the pitch to which two or three of the voices were elevated that one of the party at least in her uncle's chamber was somewhat hard of hearing her thoughts for a moment or two after she entered were too much agitated for her to pay any particular attention but all remained still below and she said to herself he has gone in to wait for my father or to sit down and rest himself as he pretends i dare say i wonder how a gentleman can have recourse to such false excuses and here i must be kept a prisoner till he chooses to go as she thus thought some words from the neighbouring room caught her ear and instantly fixed her attention it was without design she listened by an impulse that was irresistible her cheek turned paler than it was before her lips parted with eagerness and apparent anxiety and she put her hand to her brow murmuring good heaven i hope my father has no share in all this i will go down upon my knees to him and beg him not to meddle with it but the next moment other words were spoken and the look of terror passed away from her beautiful face like a dark cloud from a summer sky then again the name of sir arthur adelon was mentioned frequently and again the cloud came over helen's fair brow but now there was a surprise mingled with fear for it was marvellous to her that a man of great wealth station and respectability should be implicated so deeply in the schemes which she heard about half an hour passed in this manner and then the maid came up and tapped at her door saying he is gone miss helen and the fair prisoner glad to be released opened her door and descended to the room below what shall i do how shall i act was helen's first thought to betray them to justice i cannot i must not 
but yet it is very horrible there will be terrible bloodshed and sir arthur adelon too who could ever have suspected that he would join them oh i wish he would be warned i will tell eda she has more power over him than any one and he may be persuaded to refrain my uncle will have his course nothing will turn him i am sure and he will ruin himself utterly in the end but i do hope and trust he will have no influence over my father oh no the men said he would have nothing to do with it but hark there were steps heard descending two or three people quitted the house and after a lapse of a few minutes norris entered the room with a calm even cheerful countenance and seated himself beside helen what is the matter little pet he said you look sad and anxious is your arm paining you my dear oh no replied helen it has never pained me at all since it was set i think it is quite well now who was that came in about half an hour ago asked norris somewhat abruptly i heard the bell ring and a man's foot in the passage it was lord hadley answered helen colouring a little at the very mention of his name he came in to wait for my father i suppose or upon some such excuse my dear helen said norris laying his hand quietly upon hers have naught to do with him see him as little as possible for though to suspect you my dear child of anything that is wrong is quite out of the question for those who know you yet the frequent visits of men who in our bad taste of society hold a rank far superior to your own and especially of such a dissolute thoughtless youth as this may injure your fair fame with those who do not know you the kindly tone in which he spoke encouraged helen and looking up in his face she said this is a subject on which i much wish to speak to you for i dare not tell my father i did not see lord hadley my dear uncle for i went to my own room the moment i saw him coming and ordered the maid to tell him if he asked for me that i would not see him in those plain terms indeed exclaimed norris now much interested then he must have done something very wrong helen he has said things to me which i cannot repeat my dear uncle she replied with a glowing face he wanted to persuade me to leave my father's house and go away to london with him and and he has behaved very ill to me in short did he dare exclaimed her uncle with his eyes flashing and his cheek turning red your father must know this helen oh no no cried helen clive i dare not tell him indeed i am sure if he knew all he would kill him on the spot you know how very violent he is when he is made angry and how angry he would be if he knew i have been insulted as i have been i do know it well helen replied norris thoughtfully and i will acknowledge yours is a difficult position you are no coquette my dear child to give this man any encouragement even at the first before he had shown himself in his true colours and i feel sure you have done your best to keep him from the house indeed i have replied helen clive i have never liked him from the first though i felt gratitude for the kindness which i received from him and his friend mr dudley and expressed it but oh how different has mr dudley's conduct ever been it was to him indeed i owed my safety though the other was kind also at the time but the very night when they had brought me here he looked at me in a way i cannot describe it but it made me feel very uncomfortable and mr dudley has been always kind asked her uncle i cannot tell you how kind answered helen his manner was so gentle so like a gentleman and he seemed to feel so much for me in every way both when he was extricating me from the heap of stones and earth and afterwards when i was anxious to let my father know what had happened that i can never forget it and then when i saw him the day after there was such a difference between his conduct and lord hadley's that in any moment of danger i would have clung to him like a brother while i shrunk from the other's very look i did not know why then but i know now it is like the race of dudley replied norris and leaning his head upon his hand he fell into deep 
and seemingly bitter thought how men may be led into great errors he exclaimed at length helen your father must know of all this but i will tell him and tell him why you dared not that in itself will act as a check upon him for with high hearts like his to see the consequence of their passions is to regret them but fear not little pet i will take care to tell him when he will have time for calm thought before he can act helen it must be a daughter must not show a want of confidence in her father i would not for the world replied helen clive but oh take care my dear uncle for i tremble to think of the consequences i will take care poor thing said norris although dear helen we must never think of consequences where a matter of right and duty is concerned and now farewell thus saying he took his departure and left her with an anxious mind and agitated heart to await the coming events End of chapter thirteen chapter fourteen of the convict by g p r james this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter fourteen the afternoon had been clear and even warm every cloud had passed away from the sky and when about a quarter to six eda brandon retired to her own room to dress for dinner the sun set about a quarter of an hour before had left the sky all studded with stars she was fond of seeing the heavens and the curtains of her windows were not drawn so that while she sat at her toilette table with the maid dressing her beautiful hair she could gaze out at the orbs of light in the firmament which was spread like a scroll written with characters of fire before her eyes it was very dark however for as the reader learned in moons will comprehend from what was said at the beginning of this work the fair planet of the night had not yet risen and as eda continued to gaze there suddenly shot up through the obscurity what seemed a bright rushing ball of fire then pausing suspended as it were in the air for a moment it burst into a thousand glittering sparks which descended slowly towards the earth again what can that be exclaimed eda la ma'am it's a rocket said the maid i shouldn't wonder if it was some of those chartist people's signals they are making a great stir about here just now i can tell you miss eda and i am getting horribly afraid for what will happen next do you mean to say that such things are taking place in this neighbourhood inquired eda in some surprise i think you must be confounding the reports from the manufacturing districts oh dear no ma'am replied the maid my brother who is servant with mr gaspy told me yesterday that he had seen full fifty of them marching across two and two to some of their meetings and he and his master both think we shall have a row la there goes another rocket it's their doings depend upon it that cannot be answered eda those rockets are thrown up from the sea i should not wonder if it was some ship in distress open the window and listen if there are guns the maid obeyed but all was silent though the wind blew dead upon the coast and eda finishing her toilette descended to the drawing-room a number of the neighbouring gentry had been invited to dine at brandon on that day and the table was well nigh full as soon as that pause in devouring took place which usually succeeds when people have eaten fully sufficient to satisfy the hungry man and have nothing left but to pamper the epicure conversation which was very slack before became animated upon the subject of the movements which were taking place in different parts of the country of the designs of the chartists and of the danger of the people's holiday terminating in anarchy and bloodshed eda watched her uncle for she knew well that he entertained opinions upon political subjects very different from those of the gentlemen by whom he was surrounded sir arthur changed colour several times while the subject was under discussion but at length a young military man with somewhat rash impetuosity exclaimed depend upon it this is a disease that wants bloodletting a few inches of cold iron applied on the first attack will soon cut it short sir arthur fired at the speech and replied warmly my opinion is totally different sir 
if it be a disease at all it is one of those that are salutary in the end and likely to clear off a mass of evils which have accumulated in the pursy and pampered constitution of this country but he continued in a more moderate tone as the opinions at the table are very wide apart it may be wise to avoid politics perhaps so replied the young officer with a courteous inclination of the head and the subject dropped much to eda's relief she was destined however in the course of that evening to meet with a new subject of anxiety and annoyance lord hadley without actually getting at all tipsy took enough wine after dinner to render him overbearing and irritable and when dudley seated himself beside her for a moment in the drawing-room and said a few words to her in a low tone the young peer instantly cut across their conversation and in a haughty and domineering manner gave a flat contradiction to something which his tutor had asserted although of an amiable and usually of a placable disposition dudley instantly retorted in severe terms his growing contempt for the young peer overcoming his ordinary command over himself lord hadley's words grew high and tones loud edgar adelon and the young officer who had been one at the dinner-table drew near and the former listened with evident satisfaction to the severe castigation which the peer received at the hands of mr dudley it was given without loss of temper but yet with an unsparing and a powerful hand and the young man almost furious exposed himself every moment more and more while the contemptuous smile of edgar adelon rendered his punishment still more bitter the presence of miss brandon acted as a certain restraint and as the eyes of several ladies in the room turned upon them lord hadley with a burning heart and a flushed cheek turned away and left the room while edgar with a laugh muttered it would do him good and dudley calmly resumed his conversation with eda miss brandon however was herself much agitated and alarmed and in the course of the evening as the company from time to time broke into different groups she took the opportunity of saying at a moment when they were unobserved for pity's sake edward do not let the dispute go any farther with that foolish young man remember he is but a boy in mind at all events and really unworthy of your notice oh fear not dear eda replied dudley for your sake if for nothing else i would not suffer such an idle dispute to deviate into a direct quarrel but the relations between him and me must be immediately altered as long as he thought fit to demean himself as a gentleman and a man of honour there seemed to be nothing degrading in the position that i held now however the case is different other persons coming up prevented their farther conversation and when the guests had taken their leave eda retired not to rest but to think over events which were the cause of no slight anxiety slowly undressing she dismissed her maid and sitting down before the table wrapped in her dressing-gown meditated painfully over the probable result the moments often fly fast in thought as well as in activity and eda in surprise heard a clock which stood near her door strike one while she was still sitting at the table she rose to go to bed but at that moment a curious sound caught her ear it seemed to proceed from the park and was that of a dull heavy tramp sometimes sounding louder sometimes softer sometimes distinctly measured sometimes varied to a mere rustle it struck her as very curious and although she tried to persuade herself that it was a herd of deer passing over the gravel in the avenue yet she was not satisfied and proceeding to the window drew back the curtains and gazed out the moon was not yet to be seen in the sky but still her approaching light shed a certain degree of lustre before her the night was certainly clearer than it had appeared shortly after sunset and the stars were more faint and pale from the left-hand side of the park moving rapidly across the wide open space in front of the house at a distance of not more than a hundred yards a stream of dark human figures was seen tending towards the opposite side where the stile led down into the little valley with the stream and the old priory there seemed to be between two and three hundred men principally walking two and two but every here and there in the line they were gathered into a little knot 
and apparently carrying some heavy mass upon their shoulders at one spot within sight they halted and one of the burdens which they carried was shifted to the shoulders of fresh bearers displaying to the eyes of eda as the change was effected an object which to imagination looked much like the form of a man it seemed very heavy however and took at least eight or ten persons to carry it it required some time too to move it from one set of shoulders to another and when the party marched on again eda said to herself this must be a train of those misguided men the chartists how bold of them to come across the park i trust my uncle has nothing to do with them but i almost fear it even as the thought passed through her mind a single figure came forth from the terrace just below her and followed upon the track of the others the form however was too slight and graceful for that of sir arthur adelon it was that of a young and lightly made man and eda at once recognized her cousin edgar the moment she did so she threw open the window and leaning out spoke to him in a low voice what is all this edgar she said who are those men and what are they about i do not know pretty cousin he answered but i am going to see oh for heaven's sake take care cried eda you had better take no notice of them there were two or three hundred men and they may murder you pooh pooh answered edgar go to bed eda dear you will catch cold and then somebody will scold me to-morrow and away he walked after the party of men which he also had seen from his room as he sat meditating near the window the intruders seemed to know the park tolerably well but edgar adelon knew it better and cutting off an angle here and taking a short turn there by a hawthorn bush round a clump of chestnuts through a copse over a rise he contrived to come in sight of them continually without being seen himself till at length they reached the stone stile and paused around it in an irregular mass the young gentleman was at that moment standing with his back against a large horse chestnut tree and he could not at all make out the manoeuvres that followed some of the men stood upon the top of the stile and seemed with great labour and difficulty to lift a large and very weighty object over the wall then came another effort of the same kind and then the men began to pass rapidly into the road beyond the park as soon as the last had disappeared young edgar adelon darted out of his place of concealment and followed but by the time he reached the lane although the moon had now risen not a trace of the mob could be discovered and he was turning away to the left when suddenly a murmur of voices from the copse and valley below showed him the direction which those he sought had taken there were ways through the copse only known to himself and the gamekeepers unless indeed some of the neighbouring poachers were as learned in its recesses but following one of these paths he soon came within sight of the open space before the old priory and a strange scene presented itself to his eyes full two hundred men were there assembled some sitting on fragments of the old ruin some sauntering idly about the little green some bathing their hands in the stream which sparkled not only in the light pure and pale of the newly risen moon but in that of two or three torches which had by this time been lighted in the centre however there was a group of some thirty persons more busily employed in the midst of whom shone the torches i have mentioned and by their glare edgar now perceived for the first time clearly the heavy objects which the men had carried and saw what they were now doing with them two small field pieces apparently of brass lay upon the ground detached from their carriages which had been taken to pieces and which the mob were busily putting together a good deal of skill was shown in the task and no slight eagerness appeared in the rough bronzed countenances of the men around as they looked on or assisted from time to time the fixing the carriages together was soon complete and then came the more laborious work of slinging the cannon and adjusting them in their proper position this was not accomplished without difficulty but it was at length complete and edgar adelon felt inclined to turn away and go back to the house when suddenly a loud voice exclaimed now run them back into those dark nooks and gather round and hear a word or two eight or ten men instantly applied themselves to drag the field pieces into the recesses of the building 
and then came forth again gathering round the person who had spoken he then placed himself upon a large mass of fallen masonry and in a loud clear tone and with powerful and energetic language pronounced an harangue which gave to edgar adelon the astounding information that his father was looked upon as the leader of the rash men he saw before him and their future guide and support in schemes which seemed to his fresh young mind nothing but meat madness a part at least of their plans and purposes was displayed and with a heart filled with terror and anxiety for his father edgar adelon made his way out of the copse to return to brandon house asking himself how he should act and resolving to consult the priest as soon as he could see him on the following morning End of chapter 14